Hey guys, and welcome to another very exciting visual effects tutorial. Now it is finally time to... Holy crap! That was close. Now it is finally time to show you how to insert a 3D rendered object realistically into your video footage. Now that can be extremely simple to outrageously complex depending on whether you have a static or a moving shot, a simple static object or a fully animated dinosaur, whether you want to add physics, destruction, smoke or you want to even interact with the object. So I do see this being a little bit of a series with this being part one. In this video I want to show you how to insert a simple moving 3D object into a static shot where the camera sits on a tripod. For this tutorial we are going to be using Blender to create and animate the 3D object because it's free and awesome. We're going to render it out and then take that footage into Adobe After Effects to composite it back onto our original video clip. But let me just get that out of the way. Mm. Oh, oh, sorry Jimmy. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, this is going to be an intermediate tutorial and I will assume that you are pretty comfortable using both Blender and Adobe After Effects. If you're just getting into it, I'm going to link you some beginner tutorials down below, so be sure to check them out before you come back here. But now, before anyone else gets hurt, let's jump right into the tutorial. Welcome to Blender. Before we get into it, do note that I've decided to break this video up into two parts just because it was getting a little bit too long. In this video, which is part one, I'm going to take you through everything you need to do in Blender. This includes creating and setting up your 3D scene, matching it up with the original footage that we want to add our 3D objects into, and then creating and rendering out our 3D objects with a transparent background. In part two, I will then take you through how to composite those rendered 3D elements back onto your original footage using Adobe After Effects. But for now, let's focus on Blender. I have a default scene set up here and there are two points to keep in mind whenever you're trying to essentially composite a 3D rendered element into a real life clip. First off, you want the lighting that you set up in your 3D scene to match the lighting that you had in the actual footage because if the elements you're rendering aren't lit the same way as the elements and objects in your shot, it just won't match. So I'm going to select this light, press X and delete that because we're going to set up some different light pretty soon. The second thing you want to make sure is you want to make sure that the scale matches. If we select this default cube here and go into the object tab, you can see that the scale of this object is one meter by one meter by one meter. And that is important to keep in mind, especially when you're dealing with animations or physics, because if the objects in your 3D scene are hundreds of meters tall, but you're compositing that next to a person or a cat or something really small, it won't match. The scale of the object in your 3D scene kind of have to match the size and scale of your real life shot, otherwise this won't work. So just keep in mind that this cube is one meter by one meter by one meter. And the other thing I want to do in order to help us composite and you know visualize what this 3D rendered element in our shot is going to look like, is I want to import the footage that we want to composite this element into, into Blender so I can actually see it. Now we already have a camera in the scene and if you press zero on your numpad you will go into the camera view. So this is what the camera looks at right now. And I want to import a background image so that the background of this image is essentially the clip that we want to composite this 3D element into so we can visualize it and preview it and see what this will all look like. For that, with the camera selected, in the properties panel, let's come down into the camera settings and in here you'll find an option to enable background images. Let's tick this and expand it and in here I can now select to add an image. Now I can either import a background image or a movie clip. Let me just make this a little bit bigger so you can actually see this. So it says movie clip right here. Let's select to import a movie clip as the background for this camera view. Come down a little bit, hit open. Let's navigate to the tutorial folder and the video clip I want to import is this barrel drop.mp4. And as always, if you do want to follow along with this tutorial, you'll be able to download these files from our website. So simply go to surfacedstudio.com forward slash downloads and you'll be able to grab these files to follow along. But obviously you can just use your own footage if you prefer. With this clip selected, let's hit open clip. And you can now see this background image or this video sequence in the background for the camera view. Do note that you will only see this image when you're actually looking through the camera. The moment I middle mouse click and rotate around and I break out of this camera view, I will no longer see this background image. So press zero on your numpad to go back into camera view and the background image is back. And this is a clip that we want to composite this element into. If you scrub through, you can also see that this actually plays back this video clip itself. But let's just stay at frame zero and 
We now need to align the 3D view of our 3D scene in Blender with the actual space in this clip. Now, in order to do that, I actually want to move the camera itself. Now, do note that this cube is kind of below ground and I kind of want it sitting on the ground plane because it'll make setting this scene up a little bit easier. So with the cube selected, I'm going to press Shift and Tab to enable snapping. You can also enable that at the top here in the 3D view. Press G to move the cube around, Z to lock the movement to the Z axis. Let's just shift this up so the cube kind of sits nicely on the ground. Let's press zero again to return into the camera view. And now let's press shift and tilde or the back tip on your keyboard. This is going to get us into first person view and we can now move the camera itself. Now, another way to do that is to right click, press N to bring up the transform panel go into view and you can actually enable here lock camera to view so you can kind of move around and the camera kind of gets locked to the view but I'm actually prefer to use first person view so let's disable that press n to hide it shift and tilde so it just allows us to kind of move the camera around with w a s d e and q on your keyboard just like a first person game and what I'm doing now is I'm actually kind of positioning the camera in a way that I hope you can see the faint 3d grid I'm kind of aligning this as best as I can with the actual ground in my shot. I want this cube to kind of sit maybe over on the right hand side here, but this whole 3D space, I want it to be aligned with the ground plane in my shot. Now, because the shot is static, it's on a tripod, this is actually pretty easy. If this was a moving shot, like the camera was moving, you will need to do 3D camera tracking, which I want to cover in a later tutorial. This is really just the simplest possible case. Um, let's make sure we remain in first person view. Let me move the camera back a little bit. Remember this cube here, this 3D cube is one meter tall. So I actually want to move the camera far enough away so that kind of the size of the cube matches the size of me in the shot. I'm about one meter 75 or so. So the cube should be a little bit more than half of my size. So I'm just going to keep positioning this camera just so it kind of feels like size wise, this does somewhat match. And again, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of fudging it here. I'm not going super precise, but for a shot like this, probably don't need to go all the way out. So that actually looks quite good. So you can see the ground plane is aligned, the size matches about. And if you hit F12 now to render this out, this is going to render out the cube on nothing because the background doesn't actually get rendered. So this is just our cube here. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see because it's being rendered out on gray, but we're going to fix that up in a little bit. Now, in order to composite a 3D element into this shot, if there was an actual cube sitting here, there'd be a little bit of a shadow on the ground, potentially on the wall. There might be a reflection on the cube of this environment. And that's the next thing we need to set up to actually make this fit together. You can see down here, under my feet, there's actually a little bit of a shadow. Now it's a diffuse day. There was no sun and I highly recommend if you want to do 3D integrations, use shots where there is no direct sun. It will get a whole lot easier. If you have direct sun, you need to be pretty precise because then the shadow of the object needs to match exactly the geometry of your scene and the actual lighting situation. So it's a bit easier on a diffuse day, but there is still a bit of a shadow and we do need to replicate that when we render this out so that in the image we can composite onto this shot, we have a shadow for our cube. In order to do that, we need to create a ground. Now I can press Shift and A to go add, select mesh and add a plane. But because I actually want to add a bit of physics, just to make this a little bit more interesting, I'm going to have the cube kind of drop down and you know it collide with the ground and the back wall here if it needs to. I don't want to add a two dimensional plane. I actually want to add a floor, a ground that has volume. So I'm actually going to add another cube instead. So Shift and A, mesh. Let's add another cube. So that's going to be my ground. Also going to come into the outliner, double click onto the cube and actually call this one ground. Now I'm going to break out of the camera view and that is going to lose us this background image, but it's going to allow us to kind of see a little bit more what we're setting up with our 3D scene. Now I want to scale this cube down, but I also want it to sit directly on the ground plane. So what I'm actually going to do with snapping still enabled and again, shift and tap to turn that on off if you wanted to, come up into the top right hand side of your 3D viewpoint under options, and able to transform only the origins. If you don't see this option, make sure you have at least Blender 2.81, which is what I'm on because there was a new option that got added. So now we're only going to move the origin, press G and Z. So now I'm actually just moving the origin of this object. I'm going to snap that to the top of my ground cube, come back into the option, go out of the origin. So now I'm going to move the cube G and Z, and I'm going to shift this cube down. So now the cube kind of sits exactly on that ground plane here. But now the cool thing is because the origin is at the top of the cube, if I press S to scale, 
So now I'm scaling this cube down in relation to that origin point. So let's press Z to kind of just scale that in a little bit, just flatten it out, come out, press S again. I'm going to press Shift and Z to lock the transform to only be X and Y. I'm just going to push this out and it's going to create a big ground plane. But again, it's not a plane, it's actually a physical 3D object and it'll work better with the physics, which is why I'm doing it this way. Let's press zero again to return to the camera view so you can see where this ground plane sits. Um, S and X and just scale this out just a little bit more so it kind of covers the entire area. I can just shift it over a little bit. So this is now going to be our ground plane in my 3D view. Now I also have a back wall here, right? In my camera view, you can see there's this building here. And I want to have a bit of a plane for that as well because if I add physics and this object bounces, I want it to bounce off that wall. For that, Shift and D with the ground plane selected. It's going to duplicate it. I'm going to right click to cancel that. Again, let's break out of the camera view. Press R and 90. It's going to rotate this new ground by 90 degrees but in relation to the camera view. So let's press X to lock the rotation to the X axis. And now I want to move this back a little bit. So I kind of want to shift it along the Y axis. And now this again, is going to be a little bit, you know, just a little bit fudgy. I don't want to move this wall back too far, even though if you return to your camera view, you can't actually tell how far it's back. But if I hide this for a second, and actually let's rename this to wall as well. And if I hide the ground, you can see that from the cube, to this wall, it's probably maybe half a meter or so. So again, I want to make sure that my scale is kind of fairly spot on. So I'm going to rotate around, grab this wall again, G, Y, just kind of, you know, I just want to move this a little bit. Maybe I'll disable snapping as well, just so I can move this maybe about half a meter back from this cube. And I'm also going to move it up because it doesn't really need to be penetrating all the way through the ground. Let's return to the camera view and we can't even see our background image anymore, which isn't great. So with the viewport shading set to solid view, come over to the right hand side and open up this shading options here. And let's enable X-ray mode just so we can still kind of see that and just lower it a little bit. And again, I'm just going to position this now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this over so this wall doesn't actually extend past the edge of this building here because this wall is going to receive the shadow from the cube just like this ground is going to receive the shadow from this cube. And if this block here extends past this building, you're going to see a shadow on an invisible wall that's next to this building. So I'm kind of fake remodeling some of the 3D geometry in my scene. Now I'm keeping this deliberately simple. In the intro to this tutorial that you saw, I actually remodeled some of the shape of this background building here with the entry, the ledge here, and I kind of remodeled the curb a little bit just so that the shadow of this 3D barrel that I've essentially rendered into the shot, it, it matches a bit better onto the geometry. This is a very simple example where we just have two flat planes, but the principle is the same. Now, I just want to go over the basic techniques first, and we're going to get to all of the more advanced stuff a little bit further down the road. So now let's come to the cool stuff and actually start setting up how we need to render this out. Let's come into the render properties and our render engine is already set to EV. So if you now go into rendered view, Hmm, yeah, not really. I don't actually want to see the back wall or the ground. I do want to see my cube, but I want the cube to cast a shadow. But we also haven't set up any light or anything else that really helps us with this scene. Now, we will need to utilize something called a shadow catcher, which is a material that is essentially transparent, but you will be able to see the shadow on it. And we do need this back wall and this ground plane to be shadow catchers. We don't want to see the geometry, but we want to have objects cast a shadow on it so that in the end, what we'll have is we won't see these, but the cube will cast a shadow on those pieces of geometry. Now, Eevee doesn't yet natively support a shadow catcher. There's a hack for it, which I might cover later, but there's no simple way to do this in Eevee. So I'm going to change my render engine from Eevee over to Cycles. I'm also going to change my device from CPU over to GPU compute, which will render this whole thing out a bit faster. Let's enable visibility for the wall and for the ground. And you can see the cube is actually casting just a little bit of a shadow. But let's just set up a few lights and a few other things. Now, ideally, and I didn't do that, I would recommend whenever you want to do a 3D integration, like I'm doing here, take an environment map, like use your iPhone. There's some apps. I'm going to drop you some links in the video description down below to some apps that allow you to capture an environment map which is a 360 degree photo of your surroundings. 
The cool thing is that you can then use this environment map to light your 3D objects and that light will be exactly what you had in the actual shot that you're trying to integrate those 3D objects to. Now, because I didn't do that, I'm just going to use an approximation. So I'm going to come into my world settings now and my surface, my lighting setup right now is just set to background, which is this nice gray color. By the way, if you don't want that, you can also just change that to black or any other color you want. This is essentially the light that the world casts onto the objects in your scene but I want to use an environment map. So I'm going to click this little circle here on the right hand side of color, select environment texture, then select to open. And one that kind of matched similar-ish to my scene is this Teufelsberg Lookout 4K, which I got from HDRI Haven. Again, link in the video description. Let's just open this image. And it's kind of this industrial graffiti space, which did match a little bit of what I had in my actual shot. And if this is all starting to look a little bit too messy, let's come back into the render properties. Let's expand the film options and enable transparent. So this is going to not render the background itself, but that light, that environment map will still cast the light onto our cube. If I now press zero to go back into the camera view, our cube now receives light from this environment map. Now it is a little bit too bright, so I might go back into the world settings and just lower the strength a little bit to maybe 0.5. But again, during compositing, we can fix up some of the lighting issues as well. I also want to enable ambient occlusion, so the cube will cast a little bit of shadow on the ground and the background just by being close to it. And I do want to set up another light because in my shot, I kind of the sun was up here on the right hand side, which is why I've got some shadow underneath my feet. So in my camera view, or you can break out of that as well, shift and A. Let's add a light. I'm going to add an area light. S, scale that up just a little bit. G and Z to move it up. And you may notice that, well, we don't actually have a shadow yet at all. And that's because, well, I've disabled the visibility on the ground and the wall. So let's enable the ground plane and the wall. And you can kind of start seeing a little bit of a shadow, but we don't want to see the geometry. Let's select the back wall, come into the object properties, and let's come down here to visibility. Let's pop this open. And when you're rendering objects in cycles, you have this option here to enable a shadow catcher. You don't have that in Eevee yet. Hopefully you'll get it soon. Let's enable the shadow catcher for the back wall. And the object kind of vanished, but it does still show the shadows that are being cast onto it. Let's select the ground and also enable the shadow catcher option for that. And now let me zoom in a little bit. I hope you can see that. Can you see how this cube is actually casting a shadow here on the ground? If you disable the cube, that shadow is gone. If you enable it, that's casting a bit of a shadow. And that is crucial to integrating a 3D object with your shot because that's what's going to make it believable, right? Like the object is actually there in your scene. And this is why it's also important then to essentially model your geometry in the scene as accurately as you can because if this cube moved forward here, the shadow would kind of float above this ledge because I haven't modeled out the curb or you know the edge up here. But again, simple example here, just note that it's the light and the shadows on your 3D object that will make that effect work and sell and really feel like that 3D object is actually sitting in your shot. But again, keeping it simple for now, let's just zoom out again. Let's reselect that skylight that I'm trying to create here, come into the light properties. I'm going to pump this up a little bit more to maybe two, 300 watts, maybe scale it up a little bit as well, just so it's a little bit more diffuse, rotate that around a little bit, and maybe I'll just move it up just a little bit further. And I reckon that will probably work all right. Now we could continue on with this beautiful cube here. For the intro of this tutorial, I replaced this with the model of a barrel, but you can obviously use whatever you want to. Now the cube is a bit too boring. I don't want to go with a barrel because it's a bit heavier geometry and might not render as fast on your machine. So let me just delete this cube for now. Shift and A and let's add a monkey mesh into it. G and Z, let's just move this up a little bit. So here's my monkey head. You can rotate that around a little bit and it does look really dull and boring. So let's come into the material tab. Let's create a new material. Let's call this one monkey. And none of this is necessary. It'll just make the tutorial a little bit more interesting. For the base color, let's click on this little circle here and I'm going to select an image texture, hit open. And I've downloaded this green metal rust 4K JPEG pack from Texture Haven. And again, link in the video description with all of the different maps in them, which is really cool. So I'm going to select green metal rust diffuse 4K, hit open. So that's going to assign that as a base color onto this monkey. So I'm going to right click and select to shade smooth just so that the Suzanne hat looks a little bit more interesting. Let me just zoom in a little bit. So it's a bit easier to see what we're doing. Let's come down a little bit. I'm going to make it a little bit more metallic. 
Let's right click onto the circle next to specular. Let's just scroll all the way up and I hope they fix this menu at some point so it's a bit easier to select. Select image texture, hit open, green metal rust 4K and there's a specular map in here. Let's select that. Again, it just adds a little bit more detail, come down a little bit. And for the roughness, same thing. Let's click on this little circle here. Mouse wheel to scroll all the way back up. I think you can just also just hover the mouse at the top. Image texture, hit open, green metal rust. And I think there's a, yep, there's a roughness one as well. We could also add a bump map and other things, but it's just getting a little bit too detailed. I think this should do fine for the tutorial. And you could just render this out, right? If I hit F12 now and render out my image, I have the monkey head on a transparent background, but you can see it's got a shadow on the ground and it's got a little bit of shadow for the wall here. And let me just make this a bit smaller. And that, if you composite it onto the actual video footage, should match really nicely into the scene to have a monkey sitting on top of your real footage with a shadow on the ground and a little bit on the wall. So that's kind of the concept. That's kind of the idea of how you composite 3D objects into your scene. But let's just wrap this first part up a bit nicer and make this a bit more interesting. First, let's just add some physics. So it looks like this object is actually just dropping out of the sky onto the actual geometry in our scene. Make sure you add frame zero. Let's grab the monkey hat, G and Z. Let's pull this all the way up just above and out of frame. I'm just gonna press R and just rotate this a little bit more randomly just so that the monkey starts out just a little bit more off an odd position. Let me actually switch back to material preview just so this whole thing renders out a little bit quicker. And I don't actually wanna see the back wall or the ground because it kind of makes it hard to see what my footage looks like. So in my outliner, let's come up into this filter tab. Let's enable this viewport switch right here. So now we have this viewport switch. I'm going to disable it for the ground and the wall. The objects will still be rendered. They're just not going to be visible in the viewport so we can kind of see our monkey head. Now, over on the right hand side, I want to come into the physics settings and enable rigid body on the Suzanne monkey head. This is going to be active. Weight, maybe I'll give it 15 kilos. I want this a little bit more solid. I want to leave everything else on default. Again, you can kind of tweak this and fiddle with this any way you want. Let's select the ground. And because we don't see it in the viewport, let's use the outliner for that. Let's select the ground and everything's disabled. I think it's because I've disabled the viewport visibility. Yep, there you go. So let's add a rigid body to the ground. This is going to be passive because it's just the floor. Let's select the back wall, enable viewport visibility, rigid body, and let's make this passive. And I'm pretty sure I can turn these ones off. I don't think that should actually affect the physics, but now let's just press space and play this back. And there you go, you've now got the monkey kind of bouncing on the ground and rolling over. Now I don't actually want the monkey to kind of be bouncing towards where I sit. I kind of want it to drop and kind of stay where it is. And for that, you may just have to tweak some of the physics properties. What I'm going to do is select my monkey head, surface response, bring up the friction, also going to reselect the ground and bring up the friction, reselect the monkey head. Maybe I'll rotate it a little bit as well. And you may just have to experiment and just play this back a little bit. Yeah, see, I think that will work much better for now. Now, you can see that it doesn't actually time up with when I'm flinching, but we can fix all of that up in compositing. I just want to make sure that the physics look all right. So we've literally just got the monkey head dropping onto the floor and just bouncing off right there. And again, once we render this out, there'll be a nice shadow down here. Let's just come back to frame zero. Let's go into the scene settings. And in here, you'll find this option for the rigid body world, which is for all of the physics. And again, I've covered how physics work in a totally separate tutorial. I'm going to drop you the link for that down in the video description if you're kind of new to all of that. What I want to do is expand the cache down here, make sure that my simulation start and end matches my frame from zero to 250. And then I want to press bake. And if this option isn't enabled, make sure you save your file first. So the bake option will become available. Let's press bake. And that has essentially baked in and pre-calculated the physics. So we can kind of scrub through this at will. And this should preview pretty nice and easy because all of that is now cached and saved with your file. So you're not going to lose it. And I'm actually pretty happy with this. Again, you can keep tweaking this. You can change the physics. And again, if you model out your geometry a little bit better than just, you know, these two flat objects, you'll get something that will look a little bit more realistic. But again, we'll get to that a little bit later. Now, the next thing you need to do is configure how you actually want to export the rendered images. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come into the output settings. And under my output, let's define an actual path unless you want to just dump it on your temp folder. I'm going to create this render folder. Let's go in here. Let's give this a file name as well. Let's call this monkey 
drop underscore on. Blender will just add the frame numbers after that. Let's hit accept. I'm going to write this out as a PNG sequence and do make sure that you enable RGBA, which is red, green, blue, and alpha. So you render out this transparency channel. Otherwise, if you go RGB, the background will be black and you won't be able to composite this nicely. So go RGBA. And before you render out your final sequence, I highly recommend come into the render properties and under the sampling options, make sure you increase your sample rate for the final render, maybe to two, 300, just to make sure that your final render looks nice and clean and not grainy and ugly, and it'll actually fit into the final shot. Also expand the advanced options and make sure you enable this little stopwatch icon, just click on it next to the seed for the sampling. This ensures that from frame to frame, the sampling noise will differ and it won't look like static noise in the final render, which will make it really hard to composite this into a real life shot. So just make sure that this is enabled so that it looks a lot more organic when you finally render it out. And finally, because we actually have a moving 3D object in our shot, and if this was filmed with an actual camera, there would be some motion blur on that object. So in the render settings, come down a little bit and make sure you enable the motion blur option here as well. And now let's come back to the main menu, select render, render animation, and let's render out our final PNG sequence. Now this is going to take a little bit, so let's just fade to black and come back when this is done. And this is the final rendered out animation. This is our monkey head falling down and colliding with this invisible ground plane that matches the geometry of the scene of the shot that we want to composite this image sequence into. There's shadows on the ground and on the wall behind it. And again, if you want more detail, just you know, put more effort into modeling out your 3D scene with more detail and it will look more realistic. But for this part, hopefully this is enough. And in the next part, we're going to look at compositing this animation back onto our original footage and blending everything together nicely. But let's wrap this up for now and go back to the street. And that's all there is to it. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. And because YouTube is a bit weird, be sure to check that bell to actually get notified. If you want to support me in what I do on this channel, be sure to check out all of the links down in the video description. And as always, thank you very much for watching. And until next time, I will see you later.